Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Melanie Friedman. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I practice out of Arizona. Um, I am also a survivor of the troubled teen industry and that is what I'm gonna be speaking about today. Now, if you have ever been unfortunate enough to experience attack therapy, you may understand why I'm really nervous right now <laughs> to talk in front of a group of people. So please bear with me. <laughs> And I will have to read my speech today, but I will try to be engaging. <laughs> um, so thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and to present information on the troubled teen industry or the TTI. You may have heard about the TTI in recent news as many survivors, including Paris Hilton, have been coming forward and utilizing mass media to tell their stories of physical, sexual, psychological, and spiritual abuse. The TTI utilizes the same thought reform tactics we see in cultic groups to control youth and change their behaviors. This psychological component, which I will focus on today, creates additional complications for survivors after they leave these programs and try to restart their lives. My goal as a survivor and a clinician is to educate my colleagues and the community on the TTI and the unique needs survivors have with the hope of generating more resources so survivors can have better access to quality choices and treatment. Let's see if this works. I'm not very good at technology. So I wanna start with what is the TTI for the people that do not know? There we go, sorry that one's a little grainy. <laughs> um, so the troubled teen industry is a network of privately owned, unregulated, unregulated <laughs> behavior modification programs that consist mostly of religious programs, therapeutic boarding schools, boot camps, and wilderness programs. Overall, this system is federally unregulated, so accurate statistics are impossible. Researchers estimate there are anywhere from 10,000 to 120,000 kids in these programs each year worldwide, and it is a billion dollar industry. Reports of abuse at these programs are well documented. The goal of these programs is to change the behavior of teens. That's it. They don't care about the mental health of youth. They just want the kid with problems that was sent to their facility to come out all shiny and new and full of yes, thank yous. Length of stay is anywhere from several months to years. Teens are often sent to programs out of state and sometimes out of the country. There's no informed consent, by the way, guys. As a licensed therapist, I have to have every single client, no matter their age, sign informed consent for therapy. And you do not do that in these programs. So the TTI regularly use deceptive marketing practices. Brochures will feature smiling students enjoying a variety of activities in a beautiful landscape to lure parents in. These are usually lies, and this picture of Cross Creek is an example of what you typically get. The program that I attended was a bit unique and actually did offer activities they marketed, like choir, basketball, field trips, and school plays. But this is not the norm. These behavior modification programs offer a miracle solution to parents who have become desperate and feel they have nowhere else to turn. They promise they can fix any problem and guarantee results. In these facilities, normal adolescent behaviors are sold as pathologies. There is no scientific evidence supporting these programs or the methods they use. No assessments are done prior to or at intake to determine appropriate fit. They do not require nor provide a formal diagnosis and any diagnosis that was previously given is typically not respected. Staff is also not clinically trained. In these behavior mod programs, mental illness is seen as a character defect. That is the adolescent's fault. In, these pro in the programs that claim they offer therapy, evidence-based therapies are not practiced, and the therapist is entrenched in the program structure, so anything you say to them will not remain private and could get you punished. Programs have a one-size-fits-all approach to treatment. Whatever the problem, these programs claim their abusive tactics practices can fix it. 
Programs also often exaggerate a child's problems to convince parents it's the only way and they must act now. So for example, a teenager is experimenting with smoking weed. These programs will say, you have to act now, get them in now or they're gonna die. So these are problems <laughs> they claim to treat. And here you will see a list of problems the TTI claim to treat. <laughs> Notice there are some that are just not problems at all, such as being a part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And some are just normal adolescent behaviors. These issues can typically be addressed with outpatient care and specialized community support services. It is important to note some of these programs are practicing conversion therapy on our LGBTQIA plus youth. So where it all began, our origin story. All right, so schools for troubled youth go back to the early 1900s and before. The model for the TTI programs we see today was developed by Synanon in 1958. Founded by Charles E. Diederich, the Synanon model used confession, ridicule, and cross-examination as an attempt to change behaviors and thinking of followers. Synanon started as a temporary inpatient program to treat drug addiction. The program included workshops where members would be attacked and forced to attack other members for hours with no sleep and limited food. This was known as the game. As the years progressed, the group became more controlling and sinister, and this is now known as one of the most dangerous cults in U.S. history. Synanon disbanded in 1991 due to members being convicted of a variety of crimes, including attempted murder, where they tried to poison a lawyer with a rattlesnake in a, in a mailbox, so look it up. <laughs> um, from Synanon came copycat programs of the seed and the next straight ink. This is for you, my friend. In 1967, Mel Wasserman began using the Synanon model on troubled teens and open CDU schools. Staff was hired from Synanon and they came with no credentials or education. And then in 1992, an ex-member of Synanon developed an escort company to take an unsuspecting adolescent from their bed to the middle of the night and transport them to a facility all with force and no explanation on what was happening. This practice is widely used today. Oops, wrong way. <sighs> yep. Licensing requirements differ in each state. Utah is the state with the least restrictions and they have the most known facilities in the troubled teen industry. In states that require all behavioral health entities be licensed, there are often faith-based exemptions that programs utilize. All right, now the fun part. All right. So now I wanna dive into the structure and patterns of these programs. And as a model, I'm gonna use the program that I attended, which was the Family Foundation School in Hancock, New York, later known as the Allen Wood Academy when they tried to rebrand re due to reports of abuse had um, decreased um, kids coming in. Allen Wood Academy, they are now closed as of 2014. Um, other TTI programs will look a little different in daily structure and terminology used. However, the patterns of abuse and thought reform tactics employed are the same. I was in the family in 1998. <clears throat> the Family Foundation School was developed and staffed by members of the East Ridge Cult in Hankins, New York. They used Catholicism and an altered, unyielding model of AA as their doctrine. So how I got sent there. To be fair, I was absolutely out of control by the age of 17. I was struggling with significant mental health and behavior issues all through my teen years, and I did give my parents a run for their money. My parents tried really hard to help me and through a variety of therapeutic methods. Unfortunately, what I needed at that time and what we had access to did not align, so the problems persisted. My mother met a woman in a parent support group 
whose daughter was at the family, and she highly recommended the program. My parents did their homework, and they did it well, but the people that run these programs are master manipulators and knew exactly how to sell their program to my parents. So off I went. When I first got to the program, everything that was personal to me was taken, and I was left with just a couple of items that met their strict clothing requirements, and medication that was vital to my health was taken, and I rarely received it. I was ordered to spend my first three days doing a rigorous fourth step, which was given back to me multiple times because I wasn't being honest enough. It was not accepted until I added a whole host of lies to appease them. I was assigned a junior sponsor to show me the ropes. And later I learned to also watch my every move because they were watching mine. I could not go anywhere without a shadow, including the restroom. Our time in the restrooms and showers were always watched and time monitored. Students were divided into families. When I was in the program, there were six families. Each family had approximately 25 to 30 students family leaders who acted as our mother and father, and support staff. All staff, no matter their role at the program, were part of our treatment. We were our own little community, and many of the staff lived on family school property. Your family leaders and support staff could be anyone from a teacher to administrator, counselor, or even a groundskeeper treating you. This is what a daily schedule looked like at the family. Every minute of our day was filled and there was no free time to think, process, or decompress. Any spare time is filled with hard labor, honesty lists, and fourth steps. Even our meal times were an opportunity for a break, were not an opportunity for a break due to table topics. Table topics were the family's version of attack therapy. During each meal, just as plates were being cleared, students would hear the dreaded banging of the silverware by family leaders. At this time, students would get called up to be confronted on any number of offenses, real, imagined, or just made up by staff and fellow students. It was the student's other student's job to tear that student down through mockery, insults, and humiliation. I was once brought up for making eye contact with my peers <laughs> and brushing past a male student on the way to dinner. I was charged with being lustful and was verbally abused by everybody in the room. It does not matter how ridiculous the offense is. If you are accused, then it is expected that others will chime in and allege that you offended them as well. If they don't, then they could be a target. So does that sound familiar? This, is, this type of therapy is the game that was established by Charles E. Diedrich in Synanon and is a favorite tactic of the TTI. The system was and is kill or be killed. You either participate as an abuser or you become the abused. Even though we were all being abused by the staff, they had created a system where we were also pitted against each other. So there was no chance of us forming a united front. Students were also employed to monitor runaway and suicide risks to and to restrain other students. There was an incident toward the end of my stay in which I had become a serious flight and suicide risk. I was put on double shadow during the day and night, which meant two students were to watch me at all times. I was never seen by a staff, counseled by a professional, or seen by a psychiatrist during this time. In the family, we had sanctions, and these are some examples. I'm not gonna go through every single one of them because that would take too much time, but if you have a question, ask me after. Um, a sanction is a consequence for a behavior that you are accused of. It is very common to be on multiple sanctions, sanctions at a time, God knows I was. And there is no standard length the consequence lasts. Many were social in nature, like blackout, invisible, and exile. These are definitely, these are basically um, just different levels of banishment.
So one characteristic of destructive cults is that they have full control over the behaviors, thoughts, feelings, and information of their members, going back to Dr. Hassan's bite model. <laughs> um, cultic groups control the individual's communication with the outside world, as well as all sources of information coming in. Radio, television, and newspaper are either not available or their use is restricted. In addition, groups control when members eat, use the toilet, and if and when they sleep. These programs are no different. Their goal is to strip away every piece that makes you you and build a new shiny program version to send home as proof that their program works. They always demand complete and total honesty from us, but getting honest doesn't necessarily mean telling the truth. You are expected to only tell stories in which you behaved poorly and then describe how you feel guilty and are so grateful that the program has saved you. This includes incidents in which you were the victim, like in the case of being molested as a child, you were required to always take full responsibility. Am I on time? Okay. The following are some, um, just some examples of abuse tactics commonly used in these programs. Um, not necessarily all the family, um, but just common of the TTI in general. Uh, common punishments at the family were being put on social sanctions like blackout, exile. Um, we were forced to dig our own graves, um, heavy manual labor in place of school, being put on a diet of dry tuna and forced to sit in the corner for days or weeks at a time. Students would also be wrapped up in a blanket and duct tape and left in isolation for days with no breaks for food, water, or restroom. After several months fighting the program, they had broken me to the point I decided to conform. In these programs, you have two choices. You conform or you don't. There is no sliding by. If you don't fully conform, you are a constant target for abuse. After months of resisting and being punished for it, I decided conforming would be better than the hell I was living in. So I gave up. I did everything they said and confessed every little impure thought that I had. After weeks of perfection, I stood up at a table topic, prepared to finally be complimented and accepted. And this is not what happened. Everyone in the room laid into me harder than ever before, accusing me of faking it and not really accepting the program. But here's the thing, at this point I did. I had truly reached a state of despair and was ready to be anything that they wanted me to be. In that moment, I was experiencing what is known as the double bind, um, as developed by uh, Bateson and colleagues. This approach enhances the effectiveness of thought reform techniques. Its definition is as follows, a psychological predicament in which a usually dependent person receives from a single source conflicting messages that allow no appropriate responses, no appropriate responses to made. This sends a message of hopelessness. No matter what you do or don't do, you are wrong. At this point, I had reached a whole new level of rock bottom. A feeling of true hopelessness deeper than I had ever experienced in my life washed over me, and I began yelling back. I did not pose a physical threat to myself or to others. I was simply yelling. Well, I was grabbed by the biggest male student in the room, and with the help of my peers, I was rolled up in a blanket, secured with duct tape at my ankles, waist, and shoulders. I was carried down to the school and put in a janitor's closet with no access to food, water, or the bathroom. I know I was there for at least 48 hours, but I have little memory of that time in there. Other students report being confined in this manner for as long as eight days. Just when you don't think your mind can break down any further, it surprises you. And I don't remember much, but I do know that that was the time that I decided to run. 
and I did run. I ran twice and I made it to my hometown in central New Jersey only to get sent back even after I turned 18. In a rather interesting turn of events, and I must admit quick thinking on my part, I got myself kicked out after about seven months in program. Getting kicked out of these programs is extremely rare and difficult. So I wear this as a badge of honor and a big middle <laughs> finger to them. <laughs> My short time in the family changed my life forever. And I have a huge admiration and respect for the thousands of teens and cult survivors like you who are in these programs way longer than that. In the TTI, there is rarely a laid out program to follow that will determine your grade, date of graduation. They will let you graduate when they decide you have fully conformed and have become a program success. Doop, doop. Okay. Now, at this point, you may be asking, well, why don't you guys just tell your parents? In some cases, we do, but these programs control the narrative and have the system set so all reports of mistreatment have been predicted and explained away before the student even enters the facility. There are a lot of factors that are not in our favor that make reporting abuse riskier than it's worth. To start, we're troubled. Many of us were in the program because we have a history of lying and acting out. So the owners of these programs use that against us. Who would you believe? A kid who is known for lying and manipulating with the label of being troubled or a smartly dressed, well-respected member of society just trying to help out these poor kids. Next, at intake, staff prep parents for stories of specific accounts of abuse and warn them to watch for these manipulative tactics and stand strong against them. Incidents are never legally reported and they are always hidden from any records. The children who do report abuse to other staff are usually blamed and then punished. Image is also protected by coercing positive testimony from students, even though we were all dying inside, visiting parents would see that the scowling, angry kid they sent away was neat, smiling, loving, pol and polite. After time at the family. And we had to sell that lie to get out. If we reported it to our parents, there was a very high risk we would not be believed and then any hopes of graduation vanished and we would be forced to stay longer. So we had to lie and claim that the program saved our lives. That image of su success is also a protective factor for the programs when abuse stories do get out. Okay. Now, as I've been working through my own recovery, Am I good on time? Oh, thank you. <laughs> As I've been working through my own recovery, I've played with a variety of cult and thought reform models. I began with Lifton's criteria, which is where I first realized that what I had experienced was a thought reform program. And I have to say, that is devastating as the realization was, my gosh, what a relief it was as well. To know that sick, twisted individuals did something severely damaging to me and that I was still standing was far better than the belief that I had taken with me out of the family, that I was inherently no good, damaged and crazy, and that there was nothing I could ever do about it. This gave me the freedom to take my power back and seek recovery and put the blame where it belonged. Today, I would like to briefly review Dr. Margaret Singer's six conditions for thought reform. As I believe the TTI structure I have presented today meets her criteria. So over here, you'll see them. Can you still hear me? Okay. So I wanted to do this last because I wanted everybody to see what the TTI model actually looks like. And then we could just kind of go through and see how this model fits in. So the first one is keeping the person unaware of what is going on and how she, he, they are being changed one step at a time. Check. <laughs> um, control the person's social and or physical environment, especially controlling the person's time. 
everything there was controlled and we had no information. Um, we didn't even have watches there. So we didn't know what was going on except what was going on inside. Um, systematically creating a sense of powerlessness in the person. Um, manipulating a system of rewards, punishments, and experiences in such a way as to inhibit behavior that reflects the person's former social identity. Five, manipulate a system of rewards, punishments, and experiences in order to promote learning the group's ideology or belief system and group approved behaviors. And then six, put forth a closed system of logic and an authoritarian structure that permits no feedback and refuses to be modified except by leadership approved um, or approval or executive order. And I wish I could go through these in more detail. Um, just time doesn't allow it, but hopefully you guys can kind of see, thank you so much. You can see how that fits in. All right. Um, so now that we've reviewed the course of nature of these programs, I would like to lastly discuss some of the aftermath we're left to face as survivors. And I have to go through this super quick because I only have a few minutes left. Um, so an adolescent's, an adolescent's brain is still developing. The prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until age 25. And so the prefrontal cortex is what controls reasoning, problem solving, comprehension, impulse control, creativity, and perseverance. Chronic exposure to traumatic events such as neglect and abuse significantly impact healthy brain development and function. And obviously, if you're in abuse, that's not gonna <laughs> develop properly. Um, the limbic system, which is located in our temporal lobe, manages functions we need, to we need for survival, including our fight or flight response. This response system begins in our amygdala. So when we look at long lasting results of trauma, such as PTSD and CPTSD, we see that what happens is the event or string of events triggers a fight, flight, fawn or freeze response so intensely that the person cannot turn it off once the threat is over and remains in an adrenalized state. This is when you start to see chronic emotional and psychological difficulties which are present in a PTSD or CPTSD diagnosis, such as the following. And so these are a lot, just some of the um, after the emotional and psychological after effects that we face as survivors when we leave these programs. Um, this is an article that came out in 2018 to talk about um, the death rates that we were seeing in my specific program. This is not just about my specific program. Um, it's across the TTI. And I wanna be really clear, kids are not just dying after these programs, they're dying in these programs because of medical neglect, restraints and other reasons. So kids are dying in and after, okay? All right, now I'll finish. <laughs> um, so following the program, it is very difficult for survivors to articulate what happened as abuse. When I left the family, I didn't fit in anywhere. My relationship with my parents had deteriorated and I had turned to anything that took me outside myself. When I was in program, the world had stopped for me, but continued outside as if I never existed. When I left after seven months of being imprisoned in that camp on the hill, everything had changed and I was completely lost. I was in other placements prior to the family and following. So I had been gone for almost a year at that point. I had disappeared without a trace and my friends had eventually forgotten about me. I didn't know how to ask for help because I didn't understand the magnitude of what had happened. I thought I was just being sensitive and that I deserved every single piece of abuse because I was bad. There were moments I did try to share about my TTI trauma and the responses were not helpful. This experience is not mine alone as I have read similar accounts from hundreds of TTI survivors. This lack of knowledge of this keeps us silent and resistant to asking for help. After falling into a very dark place, I eventually decided to find recovery and this process has been long and definitely not easy. Despite my now 20 years of trauma recovery, I still struggle in many ways and I've had to accept that the family will always be a part of me. And that is why I'm here today. I want it to be different for my son's generation. I don't want these places to be an option any longer. I also want treatment 
proper treatment to be more readily available for the community of survivors still struggling. One of the biggest barriers I faced when coming home was knowing what to ask for. I didn't truly know how to advocate for myself or know what steps to take until I had become a clinician and began learning more about trauma and cult recovery. Because I became trained in trauma-informed care, I then knew what to ask for. After all of those years of therapy, I was never guided down the path I needed, and we need to do better. Survivors need quality treatment, and in some cases, case management services, to learn the life skills they need to survive and thrive as adults. These programs don't teach us how to build healthy relationships, how to set boundaries, vocational and career issues, and we can't even learn what our likes or dislikes are. There is no opportunity for life skill training. And if a life skill was learned, we can't put it on a resume. I truly hope that with the rise of social media and advocacy groups like Breaking Cold Silence and Unsilence, the mental health community learns to do a better job in treating survivors and advocating for them and getting these places shut down. Thank you.